Let me welcome everyone. Welcome to an event which is launching uh, something which is quite new at Penn Law School, but in some sense is as old as the institution. Uh, this is Public Interest Week here. Uh, and it's, an, uh, I think, an occasion in which we're looking back at all the things that have happened here over the years of public interest at Penn Law, celebrating everything that's happening now, and uh, also looking forward to a whole bunch of new opportunities uh, uh, here at Penn Law School in the public interest. Um, when I was thinking about sort of when, when Penn, in a sense, became known as a public interest law school, I have to, I, I, you know, everybody has the date at which they, they sort of uh, uh, fa look to the founding of public interest here. Many people, I think, started when um, Ed Spare, who some people in this room may remember, uh, who was one of the first public interest lawyers in the United States, uh, joined the faculty uh, in the late 1960s, which was then really a first uh, at, major, at a major American law school. And then in the 1960s, Penn Law School was really one of the first law schools, major law schools in the country, to have a clinic uh, serving the poor as part of its legal program, uh, what's now the Giddis uh, uh, Clinical Studies Program. Uh, and then in the late 1980s, we were really the first law school, major law school in the country, to establish the public interest uh, program and have a public interest requirement for graduation. Uh, since then, of course, many law schools have followed suit. Um, but it's interesting to think back now about um, what's happened since that occasion. I think if you total it up since 1989, when the program was originally founded, uh, more than 400,000 hours of public service have been uh, performed by Penn Law students. It, it's really an extraordinary number. It's the equivalent of somebody working 40 hours a week for 190 years. Um, and what that has meant, I think, in terms of the public interest community here, uh, is that the support Penn has provided uh, has really been exceptional. And, and students have worked in everything from death penalty cases, asylum cases, community development, international human rights, and a whole series of different activities which has provided service not only to the community, but also to the students themselves. I mean, connecting them up with uh, the public interest uh, bar. This week, we're celebrating that history. We also have, um, as I'm sure you know, uh, the former New York Times uh, reporter, Linda Greenhouse, who will be giving a lecture on Wednesday, and then the Sparrow Symposium, which is on Friday, when Jeremy Travis, the president of the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, will be speaking here as well. So I hope you'll make it to those events um, this week. Now, I have the distinct honor today of uh, introducing uh, this year's honorary fellow, and I can't think of nobody really better uh, to launch uh, this Public Interest Week than Stephen Bright. But before I perform my formal duties, I'd like to make two announcements uh, about what we are going to do at the law school in terms of public interest. First um, is that we are creating two public interest fellowships for um, people who are graduating from Penn Law School, uh, one of which will be joint between the law school and a, a local community organization, uh, really providing support to the local public interest community. And then another fellowship, um, which will not be limited to Philadelphia, but will be uh, internationally. Um, that's to support and help students, in a sense, get a foothold in public interest careers that are really uh, now, I think, more challenging than it's ever been. The other announcement I would like to make is that we are making a significant, um, adding significant support to the loan forgiveness program. Um, we've had the loan forgiveness program for a number of years. At various points, we've increased the support. We've decided, in effect, I won't get into the technical details, but to, in a sense, add um, the support that law school gives by about 50%. And what this will mean is, is in a sense, higher uh, eligibility requirements for loan forgiveness, more support for loan forgiveness, so that, for example, somebody who uh, is making $45,000 a year or less would uh, generally be completely covered in their loans uh, through the loan forgiveness program. Um, the intent really is to support students at a time that I know it's very difficult to pursue a public interest career, uh, and it's to at least um, let students know that we're here um, in a very uncertain economic environment uh, to provide um, support financially so that your career choices won't be as impacted uh, by the job. 
job market outside. So in any event, I did want to make those uh, two announcements. I also need to thank our alumni who are financially responsible for our being able to do that. It's the financial support of uh, people like Bob Toll in particular and others that have allowed us to provide the support that we have for public interest. So in any event, we, we have a lot going on here and a lot that's going on in the future uh, and a very vibrant community. And again, I can't think of anybody better uh, in, to kick off this week uh, than Stephen Bright. He is the president and senior counsel of the Southern Center for Human Rights. That's his formal title. But informally, he is extremely well known around the country as in what, what one reporter has called the most implacable and visible crusader for better legal defense for the poor in the country. One other write, writer describes Stephen as someone who, quote, brings a firebrand style to his mission, an uncompromising insistence that inspires some and antagonizes others. Not everybody likes him, but no one ignores him. The focus of his attention is the criminal justice system. As he himself has said about our criminal justice system, and I quote, it's the part of our society that has been the least affected by the civil rights movement. And he's made a, a career out of trying to fix that. He's head of the Southern Center for Human Rights based in Atlanta. He's worked tirelessly to eliminate the inequality and racial discrimination that he sees poor people and minorities encounter in the judicial system. His Southern Center provides poor people who've been convicted of crimes and often are in prison with greater access to lawyers and more equal treatment in the courts. The center obviously also provides representative people facing the death penalty and to prisoners facing cruel and unconstitutional prison conditions. He's worked tirelessly for improvements in Georgia's public defender system and has become widely known as one of the nation's most outspoken opponents of the death penalty. I think it may be time. Um, in 1988, he argued Amadeo v. Zant before the U.S. Supreme Court, in which the court uh, set, set aside the uh, death penalty on racial discrimination grounds. He's testified against the death penalty on a number of occasions before Congress and state legislators. He's pa a passionate advocate uh, in uh, perusing greater equality for our criminal justice system. Where did that passion come from? Well, I think if you talk to him, you'll find out it, it all comes down growing up in, in, in rural Kentucky and his father. Uh, as he says of his father, my dad was a farmer, a dirt farmer, and he was strongly of the view that it was wrong to treat people differently because of the color of his skin. And it was that view, that um, sort of uh, uh, community in which he grew up in, in rural Kentucky, which led him to, uh, to get involved from, at a very early rage in civil rights efforts, uh, as well as efforts uh, protecting the poor uh, in Kentucky. I should note that his efforts have been, no, um, been the subject of a number of national uh, books and uh, documentaries. There was a 2005 documentary film titled Fighting for Life in the Death Belt, and the subject of, he was the subject of two books published in 1999, Proximity to Death by William McFeely and Finding Life on Death Row by Katya Lezen. The legal profession has given him a number of awards, including the American Bar Association's Thurgood Marshall Award in 1998 and the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers Lifetime Achievement Award in 2008. Stephen Bright always has and always will tell it like he sees it. We expect nothing less of him today. At a 2002 symposium on indigent defense, he told his audience that he has seen court-appointed lawyers who were, and I quote, walking violations of the Sixth Amendment. And another time he complained that defendants, defendants are processed like a hamburger at a fast food restaurant. You don't need a bar card to do that. And while Stephen has accomplished much in his career, the fight is far from over. Just last Tuesday, former Vice President Walter Mondale wrote an op-ed piece in the Washington Post in which he pointed out that the protections of Gideon v. Raymart, the 1963 Supreme Court case, are deeply at risk. 
in Mondale's words, states across the country routinely fail to appoint counsel to people who are genuinely unable to afford representation on their own. That is Stephen's bright passion, and he believes that it should be all of our passion. Several years ago, a reporter captured his tendency to speak truth to power in this way, and I quote, Bright inspired some, but irritated others when his tall, lanky form rose to take strident and usually lengthy exception to anyone, including judges, he believed had downplayed the extent of the problem. The reporter added, some knew what Bright said was true, but they just wished he hadn't said it in public. Stephen, we are truly honored to have you here today because you say it in public. It's my honor to introduce this year, 2009's Honorary Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, Stephen Bright. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dean Fitz. Thank all of you for coming. I really appreciate it. It's a little easier probably to say what I have to say here than in some of the public places I uh, uh, speak sometime. I want to thank uh, David Rudofsky, who's been an inspiration to me throughout my entire career, uh, and uh, Dean Fickelstein and, uh, Fickelstein and others for their hospitality and for having me here uh, to talk to you about this. I'm just honored uh, to be at this law school and to be a part of this public interest week that you're having here. One of your graduates, uh, Patrick Mulvaney, uh, just joined our office this last summer as a staff attorney after being a, a law student here. He was a law student summer before last with us when uh, the Supreme Court granted certiorari in one of our cases, as I mentioned at lunch today, uh, Snyder versus Louisiana. And Patrick and I worked about as closely as two people can work on a case. And um, I just don't know what I would have done without him. And he, he was enormously valuable in briefing up the case. And uh, fortunately, we got uh, a, success, a good result out of it. One of many interns that we've had over the years from Penn, and we're delighted that this summer, uh, Joanna Visser is going to be joining us, uh, carrying on that tradition of, of uh, students from the University of Pennsylvania being in the Southern Center for Human Rights and spending a summer with us. Uh, driving around in some of the most godforsaken places and uh, dealing with um, uh, some of the most amazing things. Uh, in fact, we just recently, I'll tell you a little quick story, we had some students down for January and we had a hearing on uh, the way in which a sheriff was treating some prisoners at the Morgan County Jail in Decatur, Alabama. And the students were deciding whether or not they really wanted to go to the hearing the next day or not, and it's long travel. And, uh, they were only going to be there for three weeks, and I said, why don't you go? You know, you don't, you don't have any chances to go to a hearing, and maybe something unusual will happen. And so they went, and the hearing was about, in Alabama, believe it or not, the system for feeding prisoners in jail is still that the sheriffs are provided a hundred, uh, excuse me, a dollar seventy-five per prisoner by the state. And out of that dollar uh, seventy-five per prisoner, uh, they are to buy the food for the prisoners, and at the end of the year, they can keep whatever they have left over. And uh, the sheriff in Morgan County, we had found out, the uh, year before, uh, last year, uh, kept $100,000 he had left over after feeding his prisoners uh, for $1.75 a prisoner. Uh, we also found that his prisoners had lost a lot of weight uh, during the year. Uh, some of them had become emaciated. Uh, and we put on a hearing uh, before a federal district judge, uh, Judge Clemon, one of the great judges, um, one of the only great judges in Alabama, and um, we had had a, a consent order against the jail, and one of the things that fortunately was in there was that they had to provide the prisoners with a nutritious meal. And as the prisoners testified, one rather emaciated prisoner after another, uh, about uh, getting in the morning a little bit of uh, grits and getting for lunch uh, part of a, an egg uh, and so forth, uh, the judge became increasingly unhappy about it. But what really took the cake, I think, was the sheriff testified, and he told him about how he had managed to buy 
uh, for $500 a truckload, an 18-wheeler, in fact, uh, of corn dogs. If you've ever been to the fair or whatever, and you've ever gotten a corn dog, usually one's enough. Uh, but he managed to get an 18-wheeler full of corn dogs, and for three months, the only meal at the jail, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, was corn dogs. And um, uh, Judge Clemens stirred uneasily as he heard this testimony. And at 5 o'clock, as the hearing came to an end, he said, uh, Marshals, uh, take the sheriff into custody. And uh, they did. And uh, the sheriff was uh, uh, held in contempt of court and, and taken to a federal prison. Uh, so for the students, it was a pretty interesting hearing. Uh, for all of us, it was. Um, so you never know what, um, uh, what you may find in the practice that we have as you go around the South and, 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 and look at um, uh, the practices and the jails and the prisons, the death penalty cases, and, and so forth. Uh, last time I was here was for a symposium that the Journal on Constitutional Law was having on the Eighth Amendment, and I wrote an essay on race and poverty and the death penalty, and I don't know whether it's just been published, maybe somebody's on the journal and can tell me, or whether it's about to be published, but I know the proofs have, have been sent back, and um, it'll sort of be an extension of whatever I, I have to say here today. I sort of see my role as reporting sort of from the field uh, to law students or to the law schools um, about why the criminal justice system, which is really what I've dealt with for the last 30 years, is failing. Uh, so abysmally. Uh, obviously, I have to generalize because we're talking about systems in 50 states and different communities and in each of those states, uh, uh, thousands of communities actually that hold court, whether it's city courts, local courts, state courts, federal courts, whatever. Uh, but talking about the prosecution of men, women, and children accused of crimes, and I've talked about, as the dean said, the fairness of that process, and most importantly, uh, discretionary decisions made by prosecutors and how those affect people, the severity of the sentences that are imposed from weeks in jail or weekends in jail to uh, months in jail to uh, that may cost people their homes or, or, or their uh, jobs or, or whatever to uh, years in prison to life imprisonment without parole to the death penalty. Uh, to registries such as those that we have for sex offenders which stigmatize people and make it even more difficult for them to find work and shelter and move on with their lives. Uh, fines and fees which also keep people either perpetually in debt like it was back during the sharecropping days or uh, puts them in jail for their poverty. The modern debtor prisons don't think there are no debtor prisons anymore because there are and there are thousands of people in prison because they can't pay uh, the fines that are imposed upon them and the private probation fees which they have to pay each month while they're trying to pay the installments on their fines, uh, the continuing role of race in influencing decisions, and the conditions and practices in the jails and prisons where we now have 2.3 million men, women, and children. Uh, housed, many of them mentally ill, many of them uh, there for addiction, uh, largest incarceration rate of any country in the world. Um, and then also conditions of probation and parole, which can either help people out of the system and to become useful and productive uh, members of the society, or can forever entangle them in it so that they never uh, get out of it. Uh, my own view, which is not what I'm going to really talk about here today, but that is the system is destroying individuals and families and, and communities, and that our country is spending billions of dollars uh, to bail out those who have failed spectacularly, and um, billions more to stimulate the economy. And if ever there is a place where we need to spend money uh, to bail something out, uh, it is the criminal justice system which has been failing spectacularly uh, for years. And the effort to try to make the people in the system who are poor, this is a system that deals almost exclusively with poor people, 
I mean, oh yes, every now and then Martha Stewart or somebody flits through and gets a lot of publicity. But this, if you go to court day in and day out, the people being processed through the state courts are poor. They can't afford a lawyer. They can't afford an expert witness. They can't afford an investigation of their cases. They are poor. Uh, and these people are being denied their liberty and their life uh, by this system. And uh, it is a system that is not producing reliable results on even, in some cases, the most fundamental question we ask it to decide, which is guilt or innocence. Uh, in Illinois, the governor some time ago now de declared a moratorium on executions because there had been 12 executions in Illinois and 13 people had been exonerated, been found to be completely innocent, even though they've been sentenced to death. These are people sentenced to death. Um, the last one was a fellow named Anthony Porter, who was going to be executed. Uh, the only reason that he wasn't was because there was a question about his mental abilities, whether he was mentally capable of understanding why he was going to be executed. You can't be executed unless you realize at the time you're being executed that you're being punished for a crime. If your mental situation is such that you think something else is happening or you don't understand that, you're treated until such time as you do understand and then you can be executed. But you do have to understand that you're being punished for a crime. He was brain damaged, he was very mentally retarded and there was a question about whether he understood why he was being executed and while there was a stay in place to determine that question, he had been through all the appeals, all the review that there was. The undergraduate journalism class at Northwestern uh, uh, examined his case and did an investigation which proved that Porter could not possibly have committed the crime. And even went so far as to get a confession from the person who did commit the crime. And Porter was released. Uh, after 16 years on death row. I think that's what convinced Governor Ryan to stop the process at that point. Some people have said, well, that shows the system works. And I've never understood how it could be that spending 16 years on death row for a crime you didn't commit proves that the system works. Uh, or how it could be that when undergraduate journalism students as a class project go out to see whether or not the people on death row are innocent or guilty or not, that that somehow proves when the lawyers have failed, the judiciary has failed, the police have failed, that that somehow shows the system works. This was the third person out of those 13 exonerations, the third person exonerated by the journalism students at, at Northwestern. I guess if they had taken chemistry, uh, this would have never come to light. Uh, about Anthony Porter's uh, innocence. And I want to talk about one of the reasons uh, for that. There are many reasons, but one that I think is most fundamental, and that's the right to counsel. And I want to work out a little bit with you as we talk about it, the responsibility of lawyers, all lawyers, not just the lawyers defending people, but all lawyers, all members of the legal profession, uh, for providing representation. And really, there's a question in both civil and criminal cases. Because one of the things you know probably if you take the, the, the elective course you can take the first year here about access to justice is that most of what we learn in law school is irrelevant to most people in our society because most people cannot afford lawyers. Uh, it's a disgrace, I think, uh, to our profession. Uh, that for the most part, uh, civil legal services are not available. The legal aid, uh, legal services programs that are only a small percentage of the people who are eligible uh, are, are able, to, those programs are able to serve because it's been cut back so much in the funding uh, since Governor, President Carter uh, had actually expanded those programs. But uh, President Reagan zeroed them out every year when he was president and only through a struggle in the Congress where they're restored with some funding. But, but that's more than I can talk about just out of time. It's an awful death to be talked to death. And I want to just focus on the criminal side, if I could. And one reason is because it's a constitutional right. And if we're not even meeting our constitutional responsibilities, we can see how far, of course, we have a long way to go on the civil side. 
this month, March, marks the 46th anniversary of the Supreme Court's decision in Gideon versus Wainwright, establishing the constitutional right to counsel. And the story of Gideon you may know, but if you don't, it's a good story and it's worth telling. Uh, Clarence Earl Gideon was a man who broke, or was accused of breaking into a pool hall in Panama City, Florida. And in his trial, he demanded a lawyer. In those days, you didn't get a lawyer for that kind of crime. And Clarence Gideon said, I'm entitled to a lawyer. And the judge said, Mr. Gideon, I'm sorry, you're not entitled to a lawyer. He said, I'm entitled to a lawyer. The Supreme Court of the United States says I'm entitled to a lawyer. Actually, the Supreme Court hadn't said that, but that's what he said. And he did a better job probably preserving the issue than a lot of lawyers do today. Uh, he was convicted, and he was sent down to Rayford, uh, uh, Florida State Penitentiary. And on the stationery they had there for you to write writs on, it had institutional rules at the top, five pages with a pencil, he wrote a petition to the Supreme Court, actually very articulate, saying that he was entitled to a lawyer, that he wanted the Supreme Court to review his case and to grant a writ of habeas corpus to re release him because he had been denied a lawyer at his trial in Panama City. The Supreme Court granted the writ, appointed Abe Fortas of uh, Arnold, Porter, and Fortas at that time, law firm, to represent him. Fortas later became a justice of the Supreme Court. Uh, interestingly, Florida, which was the state in which he'd been convicted, tried to get amicus briefs in support uh, but 22 states, uh, Dean mentioned Walter Mondale's uh, uh, op-ed in the Washington Post last week. Walter Mondale at that time was the Attorney General of Minnesota. And when the request went out for amicus briefs, uh, Walter Mondale said, I, I'm going to file an amicus brief, but I'm filing on, on behalf of Gideon. And 21 other states joined Minnesota in filing on Gideon's behalf, saying that there ought to be a right to a lawyer. And that if we're going to have a criminal justice system with any fairness, people had to have a right to a lawyer. And only two states filed on behalf of Florida, North Carolina, and, of course, Alabama. Um, the Supreme Court uh, hears the case, and it's unanimous opinion, that nobody can be uh, tried in a felony case without being provided a lawyer. And um, the case is remanded for a new trial. It goes back to Panama City. Clarence Gideon is provided with a lawyer. And, uh, and he's acquitted at his trial. Lawyers do make a difference. And if you don't have anything better to do some afternoon, read Anthony Lewis's marvelous little book. You can read it in one sitting, Gideon's Trumpet. And in, in Gideon's Trumpet, after describing the trial and the appeal, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful story. It's hard to believe it's true, uh, but it is. Uh, he sort of summarizes Anthony Lewis, the, the challenge there. He said it's going to... It will, it will be an enormous task to bring to life the dream of Gideon versus Wainwright, the dream of a vast, diverse country in which every person charged with a crime will be capably defended, no matter what his economic circumstances, and in which the lawyer representing him will do so proudly, without resentment of an unfair burden, sure of the support needed to provide an adequate defense. Of course, the first thing you've got to learn about Gideon is it's not a dream. It's a constitutional requirement. But the problem, of course, it's an unfunded mandate, even though it's a constitutional mandate. It's enormously costly to provide every poor person accused of crime with a lawyer, investigative support, expert support, whatever else is needed. At the time, that Gideon came down, the Attorney General of the United States, Robert F. Kennedy, pointed out that the poor person accused of a crime has no lobby. Uh, actually, at that time, it wasn't completely true because Robert F. Kennedy, even though he was the Attorney General and the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of the United States at the time, was a pretty effective lobby for poor people, and he got the Criminal Justice Act passed so that in the federal system, there were public defender offices and a system of providing lawyers for poor people accused of crime. But he was certainly very accurate in terms of in the states, and certainly since that time, we certainly haven't had an attorney general like Robert Kennedy. Um, but beyond that, it was unclear what 
what was meant by providing people with counsel. The Supreme Court didn't define what it meant by effective counsel for 20, 20 years after Gideon was decided. Uh, there was no, no definition of poverty. Who, and this is what uh, Vice President Mondale wrote about in his op-ed last week in the Post, which is that if Clarence Gideon were facing those charges today in Florida, he might well not qualify for a public defender under the rules that Florida now uses to determine eligibility for a court-appointed lawyer. That because if he had uh, a car, if he had any kind of assets, even though he wouldn't be able to turn them into money, and even though they wouldn't be enough to retain a lawyer, because in a felony case you're going to pay at least $5,000 uh, for a lawyer, and probably more than that, and you're going to have to pay all that money at one time because there are not many lawyers that are going to send you a bill uh, for their services. Um, uh, the ability to hire a lawyer uh, depends upon how much readily available cash you have at the time. And yet the guidelines and the eligibility rules that many states have adopted are completely unrealistic. In Georgia, for example, it's 125% of the federal poverty guidelines. The federal poverty guidelines measure destitution, whether you're starving to death, not whether you can hire a lawyer. And of course, somebody who's starving to death can't hire a lawyer. I remember being in a court one time where the judge uh, told this uh, uh, woman who was there that uh, she, her, she had on her some jewelry, which was her wedding ring and, and, and some other jewelry, and that he was not going to let her have a court-appointed lawyer unless she went and sold her jewelry. Uh, it was very humiliating. Of course, the whole courtroom was full, just like this, and she's standing there at the microphone, and she's crying, and she needs a lawyer, and she doesn't have any idea what's going on. And, and uh, at any rate, the long and short of it is she goes to the pawn shop, and she sells her wedding ring and her, her necklace and gets $70 for them and comes back and tells the judge that. Um, uh, that's the sort of thing that a lot of poor people go through, some of whom don't end up with lawyers, uh, at the end of that process, and, and, and some of whom do. Uh, some states, to, to, to provide lawyers for people, conscripted lawyers, that is, just made lawyers represent people whether they wanted to or not, some states, Louisiana most particularly, uh, still do that. If you're in practice, if you're in Lake Charles, Louisiana, and you set up law practice there, uh, you may be asked every so often to represent somebody accused of a crime. You may have no idea how to represent a person accused of a crime. You may not understand the criminal code or know uh, how to defend someone. It doesn't matter. You'll still, that's just part of your responsibility as a member of the bar. Uh, but some places develop public defender offices. Uh, some places have developed appointed lawyer programs where lawyers are appointed and they're paid by the case or they're paid uh, by the uh, hour for for what they do. Uh, some places have developed contract systems. Dothan, Alabama, five lawyers, and they're paid to handle a fifth of all the uh, indigent cases, and they pay a flat rate, and you handle a fifth, however many that turns out to be. And plus, you can have a private practice as well, which gives you sort of a disincentive to spend much time on your court-appointed cases. Um, all of these systems, of course, are going to depend upon the funding that's provided. The old adage, uh, you get what you pay for, um, is pretty clearly reflected uh, in all of these kinds of programs. The Federal Defenders, which, as I said, was created with the support of uh, Attorney General Kennedy, um, is exemplary programs in most parts of this country. And a Federal Defender may handle 90, 100, 110 cases in, in a year. The Philadelphia Defenders here, Mark Bookman, who's here this evening, the head of the Homicide Squad, is another exemplary program, a state program, it says the D.C. Uh, public defenders. But on the other hand, you'll find defender offices around this country where lawyers handle 1,200 to 1,700 cases in a year. That's a huge difference. Um, ABA standards are 150 felonies and 300 misdemeanors. And just sort of understand that, I mean, you can sort of imagine if you're taking 15 credits a semester, you can handle that pretty well. Now that's 30 a semester. Ooh, it's getting a little dicey now. 45 a semester. Now we're really having to hustle at 45. And then let's go on up to 60. And you can see that as you add on, obviously, it's becoming more and more difficult to devote, to, to devote much time to each case, at each class, or if you're talking about clients, 
if you're representing, as the public defender I was talking to the other day, 120 people at one time, it's very hard to know all their names, to recognize them and know their names, and to keep up with their cases and to conduct investigations and, and, and to do uh, whatever. Some court-appointed lawyers are paid as little as $50 a case, and some contract lawyers are paid uh, $50,000 to handle 150 cases. And the result that I see in courtrooms as I travel around is what's known as the meet them and plead them system, that the, uh, uh, the judge is sitting on the bench and the client comes in very often in orange jumpsuit, handcuffed to another person, they meet the lawyer, there's a very brief discussion, and they whisper back and forth and what the plea offer is and what, uh, how much time they're going to serve, and whatever, and then they come up and the lawyer announces it's going to be a plea, he's pleading guilty to this, the judge asks very quickly, uh, you understand this is a plea, you're going to get sentenced to this, and then runs through, just like if you've ever been to an auction, you hear the auctioneer, I mean, that judge talks so fast you can't understand a word he's saying, and that court reporter is just pounding away those keys, trying to keep up. But it doesn't matter, because it's the same every time. you got a right to remain silent, you got a right to a lawyer, you got a right to da, 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 all those rights you got. And at the end of it, then the defendant's in there just barely just looking, knowing, you know, yes, no, Yes, you know. And at the end of it, the judge says, all right, I found this a knowing, intelligent, voluntary waiver of rights. I accept the plea. I sent you three years on down the road. Then on to the next one. And that often is all the representation that someone gets. That's the totality of the representation. Maybe they got to have a little meeting with a lawyer at the jail, and they heard about this beforehand. But maybe this little meeting in the courtroom is all they get. And the result of this is that you have things like, a case we had in Georgia where they found out on the third day of trial that the wrong defendant was on trial. The trial was supposed to be of one person and the wrong, a different person had been sitting at counsel table and the lawyer didn't know his client well enough to realize that the guy sitting next to him was not the person whose case was being tried. The lawyer said, well, he kept telling me it's not me, it's not me, but I thought he meant he was innocent. I didn't know he meant he wasn't defended uh, in the case. Uh, we just recently ran across in one judicial circuit in Georgia 200 people, over 200 people, that, that don't have lawyers at all facing felony charges. Uh, some have not had lawyers all the way back to August. None have had lawyers at all since they were arrested, but some have all the way back to August have been arrested, came into the system. Um, some have been called upon to plead guilty or not guilty. You're not supposed to do that without a lawyer. Uh, but this is, the, this is the tricky part. How do you enforce the right to a lawyer if you don't have a lawyer. Your lawyer is what you count on to enforce all of your constitutional rights, to put all your evidence up, to cross-examine the other side, to do everything. But if you don't have a lawyer, if you come into the system without a lawyer, Gideon says you can't be held without a lawyer, but here you are, you're in jail. By golly, you're being held. There's no question about that. But you don't even know you've got that right. And then you get indicted by the grand jury and you're called upon to plead. And there's two Supreme Court cases that say you cannot have a person uh, plead without the assistance of a lawyer. That is, enter a plea of guilty or not guilty. But the judge up there just simply asked, all right, Mr. Jones, what's your plea? You're accused here of armed robbery. Guilty or not guilty? And you're like, well, I'm guilty. I probably ought to plead guilty. Nobody's to explain anything to you. Uh, what do you do? Well, now, of course, if you had a lawyer, your lawyer would tell you, you know, first of all, you can't do this without a lawyer. Uh, secondly, here are your options, and, and here's why you might enter a not guilty plea, and, and, and so forth and so on. Um, but there's no, no one there to protect the right to counsel. The judge is not doing it. The prosecutor is not doing it. And those are the only lawyers that are in the courtroom. That are there. This is a big problem with the right to counsel, uh, in my opinion. And if you have this kind of representation day to day, then that's what kind of representation you're going to have, or you're not going to have very good representation in the capital cases in states like Texas and Alabama and Virginia, the states with the largest death rows. Jamie Weiss in Georgia spent well over a year without a lawyer pending trial, death penalty trial. Imagine that. You're on trial for your life. You're from West Virginia. You're in a state where you don't know anybody. And you're facing the death penalty. And you don't have a lawyer. You don't have anybody to talk to about your case. 
in Houston, three different cases. Houston has sentenced over 100, over 100 people sentenced to death in Houston have been executed. Only one other state besides Texas has executed over 100 people. That's Virginia. And it has not executed as many people as Harris County, Houston, Texas. So that's the capital of capital punishment. And three people, three people sentenced to death in Houston were sentenced to death at trials where their lawyers slept during the trial. Joe Cannon and two, and another lawyer named John Ben and the other one. Uh, you know, I'm not saying everybody sleeps during trial, but what, what are we saying when we have lawyers sleeping during trials, uh, capital trials? Uh, we had a client, Judy Haney, in uh, Talladega, Alabama, whose lawyer was so intoxicated uh, during the trial that he made a gesture, sort of, and he just fell over on the floor, and he couldn't get up. And so the judge had to get the sheriffs to pick him up and saw that he was intoxicated, and so he said, all right, we're going to suspend the trial for the day, sent the jury out, sent the lawyer to the jail, and sent Ms. Haney back to jail. And the next morning, he produces both the lawyer and the client from the Talladega County Jail and resumes the trial as if this is the most normal thing in the world, holds the lawyer in contempt, sentences him to a day in jail, and on we go, uh, on they go, uh, with the trial, uh, with no evidence put on of the fact that this is a battered woman who killed her husband after he had just terrorized uh, her and her children for 15 years. Um, the most fundamental element of fairness in an adversary system is the representation of the accused by competent counsel, no matter how great or how small the charges. And there's report after report, ABA reports, state bar reports, um, article after article, and many examples, and I won't go through others, but I will just use one that I think sums up what the courts will tolerate. This is just a recent decision that came out of the Sixth Circuit. And it involved a man named Jeffrey Leonard, this 20-year-old brain-damaged African-American man who was tried and sentenced to death in Kentucky by a jury that did not even know his name. Now, I've seen lots of cases with lots of things juries didn't know about clients, didn't know about the facts of the case, but this one kind of takes the case. He was tried under the name James Slaughter. And I will tell you, as someone who's handled capital cases now for about 30 years, if you wanted to pick a name for a client in a death penalty case, James Slaughter would not be the name uh, you would want. Uh, the lawyer conducted no investigation. He never found out that his client, um, Jeffrey Leonard, was brain damaged, that he had the, one of the most terrific childhood uh, imaginable. And he never found out his client's name. Uh, even though it was in records that were there. Uh, he testified, the lawyer did, that he had tried six capital cases and that he had been the head of an organized crime division, of the prosecutor's office in New York. These were complete lies. He had never tried a capital case and he had never organ been in any New York prosecutor's office. Nonetheless, Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit upholds. says, well, the lawyer didn't do a very good job, but it didn't make any difference. The jury wouldn't have done anything differently if they had known about his brain damage or his childhood abuse or anything else. And Judge Cole wrote this in dissent from denial of rehearing on Bonk. We are uneasy about executing anyone sentenced to die by a jury that knows nearly nothing about that person, but we've allowed it. We're uneasy about executing those who commit their crime at a very young age, but we've allowed that as well. We're particularly troubled about executing someone who suffers brain damage. We rarely allow that, especially if the jury has not afforded the opportunity to even consider that evidence. But we've allowed that. Jeffrey Leonard, known only to the jury as James Slaughter, approaches the execution chamber with all of these characteristics. We reach a new chapter in our death penalty history as the majority decision decides that we will allow this as well. It certainly fails the Constitution. Well, that wouldn't raise an eyebrow in Texas, um, where, as I said, three people were executed in trials where their defense lawyers slept, one of whom was executed, one got a new trial, and one is still uh, under death sentence today. 
One federal judge reluctantly upholding a death sentence out of Texas observed that, quote, as interpreted by the United States Supreme Court, the Constitution does not require that the accused, even in a capital case, be represented by able or effective counsel. Make sure you heard that right. The Constitution, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, does not require that the accused, even in a capital case, be represented by able or effective counsel. Well, whether someone, of course, some of the lawyers are very good to take cases. Some lawyers work hard no matter how little they're paid. And so for many of the people facing the death penalty, whether or not they're ultimately sentenced to death or not is just simply the luck of the draw. Whether or not, not so much whether they commit the worst crime, but whether they have the misfortune of being assigned the worst lawyer. But what kind, what kind, of, what kind, of, what kind of process is that? Uh, and what can we as a legal profession uh, say about that? I mean, in theory, the right to counsel is going to be protected because there's a post-conviction right to challenge your conviction and say uh, that there was a Sixth Amendment denial of the right to counsel. But the catch-22 for poor people is that you need another lawyer to represent you on your post-conviction representation, and you have no right to a lawyer. And, of course, in the some states that do provide lawyers, uh, you might get a lawyer who's just as bad or is worse than the one you had to begin with. People ask me all the time, why do so many people get executed in Texas? Because Texas executed 450 people, and most other states, as I said, haven't executed even 100. And it's very simple. There's no due process. If you don't have due process, you can execute people at just about any rate you want. The lawyers appointed represent people in Texas. Uh, Grease the skids. Uh, and one example is that six people in Texas have been executed without any post-conviction review at all. The lawyers have missed the statute of limitations. Sort of basic. When you get out of law school, be sure to find out when does the statute of limitations run. Because missing the statute of limitations, that's kind of fundamental. But here's what's, re what's really interesting. Of those six cases, three were by the same lawyer. Missed the statute of limitations three times. And when he missed it the last time, he claimed that he tried to file, but the time stamp machine at the federal court was broken. The judge, in denying him, pointed out two things. One, the time stamp machine was not broken. Two, he had used the same excuse the last time he missed the statute of limitations, and the timestamp machine was not broken that time either. Now, my question is just this. What is this lawyer doing handling death penalty cases in Texas? How did he get to handle the first case where he missed the statute of limitations, but then how the second, and then how the third? And does anyone care? Other people in Texas have had the misfortune to be represented by lawyers who copied verbatim their uh, direct appeals into their habeas petitions, which was of, uh, of no, you know, there's no issue there because the case had already been ruled on. A lawyer for a fellow named Justin Fuller, I guess didn't have time to write a new brief for Justin Fuller, so he just simply took a case he had filed two years ago and he just filed it and put Fuller's name on it. And, and, and believe it or not, the court denied it and let Fuller get executed. The court didn't say, wait, wait, wait a minute. These are the wrong names in here. This is the wrong. Everything here it applies to a different case. It doesn't apply to this case. I don't understand why judges put up with that. But um, another case, a fellow named Daryl Acker, who's got about an eighth grade education, 90% of the brief filed on his behalf. Acker wrote the brief, not his lawyer. His lawyer just put in letters and things uh, that, that Acker had, had written. And there's example after example, one story after another, and each one sadder than the rest. And notice who pays for this, not the lawyers. Lawyers get paid $25,000 in Texas to file these things. And the lawyers um, go on, even if their licenses were revoked, even if they were criminally prosecuted, which they should be, uh, it would do absolutely nothing to help their clients who are executed for the mistakes that they made. 
Our system has completely lost sight of justice in a tangle of procedural rules, pretenses, and administrative concern. Finality and not justice has become the ultimate goal of the system, moving dockets, not competent representation is the concern of most of our courts. Technicalities, uh, procedural rules that were made up by the courts and the legislatures take priority over the Bill of Rights. And we've convinced ourselves that we just can't afford justice, so we've just got to do with what we have. And now with this financial crisis in the country, the quality of lawyering is going to suffer even more because we have these budget cuts across the board, 6%, 10%, even 20% in some places. And of course, public defenders should be exempt because this is constitutional. It's not constitutionally required to pave a highway to anywhere, but it's constitutionally required to provide people with representation if they're facing a loss of their life or their liberty. But the governor of Kentucky proposed a budget just the other day which reduced funding for the prosecution, reduced funding for the defense, but increased funding for the Department of Corrections so that it can build a new prison. The new public defender in Jacksonville, Florida, just fired the 10 most senior public defenders. The 10 most senior, this is an office that's been in existence since Gideon. Fired the 10 most senior lawyers and replaced them with brand new lawyers to save money on, on that office. But this system has its defenders. And I just want to comment on that and, and, and talk about what you can do. Richard Posner, the judge on the Seventh Circuit, and very highly respected in some circles, wrote this in one of his books. I can confirm from my own experience as a judge that criminal defendants are generally poorly represented. So he and I are on the same page there. But he goes on to say this. But if we are to be hard-headed, as these law and economic types tend to be, if we are to be hard-headed, we must recognize this is not necessarily a bad thing. The lawyers who represent indigent criminal defendants seem to be good enough to reduce the probability of convicting an innocent person to a fairly low level. If they were much better, either many guilty people would be acquitted or society would have to devote more resources to the prosecution of criminal cases. A bare-bones system of indigent defense may be optimal. Did you hear that? Now, notice what he did not say. He said that if the defense lawyers were better, more guilty people might be acquitted. He missed completely the point that if the defense lawyers were better, more innocent people would be acquitted. That just didn't even register with the judge. Uh, and notice that this bare bone system, it's not for commercial law now. It's not for bankruptcy reorganizations. It's not for reorganizing the assets of the upper 1%. It's only for poor people. This bare bone system that might be optimal. I think this is very dangerous thinking. And I think it's completely at odds with our principle of equal justice under law and with our democratic values. And this is not indifference, which is what I have always worried so much about. It is affirmative support for the state of affairs that we have now. During the time that I've worked for representation for poor people accused of crimes, I keep hearing the same thing. When we were working on this in Georgia, I heard this. When I was down in Louisiana working on uh, the New Orleans Public Defender and in different places, and somebody will always say this. Now, you know, we don't, we, we don't want a Cadillac. We, we just want a Chevy. We always hear that. We don't want a Cadillac. They never say Lexus. They always say Cadillac. Cadillac still does. It's still got a good brand. Um, and I'm always sitting there thinking, gosh, you know, why is this? We're talking about life and liberty. Now, why, why wouldn't we want a Cadillac? Why, why would we want just a, you know, a, a, you know, most places we just have a horse and buggy. Uh, but, but why... Why would we have such a poverty of vision uh, with regard to how we protect life and liberty? I mean, we can afford to evade Iraq. 
we can afford billions and billions to bail out the greediest people in, in the world. Surely we can afford to give a person a little justice before we tie them down and put them down. I think the answer is that we have either set our sights on the embarrassing target of mediocrity, which is sort of halfway justice, and halfway justice is, is, is really no justice at all, or we have just put this out of sight and out of mind. And so what does this say about our society, and, and, and what does it say about the legal profession? Both can claim ignorance. I think the claim is much stronger for the society where the poor people and people of color are out of sight and out of mind for the most part until your kid gets arrested. But for the most part, don't know what's going on in the criminal justice system except what they see on law and order in those programs. But I don't think the legal profession can use that excuse. I don't think the legal profession can be ignorant and I don't think it can be indifferent. And I think that it must be aware and I think it must be ashamed. We cannot be proud of a legal system that allows these injustices to occur day after day, year after year, and to get worse and to become part of our legal culture, which it is now. This is a part of our legal culture, and it's accepted. It's accepted by the judges, it's accepted by the prosecutors, it's accepted by the bar, and it's more or less accepted by everybody. We have lost our capacity of outrage. And what's going on in these courts is outrageous. And we need to renew that and fire it up. And as a lawyer, one has the opportunity to work on several levels. To work for major changes, for improving public defender systems, but also to work with clients one at a time. One at a time. No matter what's going on, the legislatures are failing, the courts are failing, the administration's failing. Like the Underground Railroad, where you could be against slavery, you didn't know what was going to happen to it, but you knew that you could help one person at a time. My friend Billy Moore, who spent 16 years on death row in Georgia, tells me about when he first got sentenced to death. And the judge said, on such and such a day, you'll be taken, and so many volts of electricity will be run through your body, and may God have mercy on your soul. So and his lawyer never told him that there was an automatic appeal, that that date was a meaningless date. And so as that date gets closer, he gets more and more apprehensive that he's about to be executed. And that day comes and nobody has told him that he's not going to be executed that day. Can you imagine you see the value of a lawyer who cares enough to just talk to his client and counsel his client and inform his client about what's going on? That's what lawyers do. Lawyers counsel. Lawyers talk to their clients, comfort their clients, minister to their clients, all in addition to representing their clients. But that's all somebody had to do in that case and didn't do. Individual lawyers can take cases and counsel clients and tell their stories and speak the truth to power in the courts and in the communities, and it will make a difference. And if enough people do it, it'll make a bigger difference. But whether enough people are doing it or not, it'll make a difference. You just have to see. I've been sort of a voice crying in the wilderness. I don't know how much difference it made, but, you know, my view about it was, whatever difference it makes, we'll, we'll try it. But we've got to remember this is all something that, of course, is part of a broader agenda and is bigger than any of us. Ultimately, the answer to crime in our society is every child having at least one adult who loves them unconditionally and provides the nurturance and protection and guidance that child needs and a society that provides education, opportunity, and hope for that child. We've got to make sending children off to juvenile prisons absolute last resort, and we've got to give people second chances and the support needed to make it and not set them up to fail with all the things that we're doing now. But trying to make the right to counsel and the right to people to be there for people is going to take sustained commitment. It's not going to be solved in a short time or probably in, certainly not in my lifetime and probably not in yours and maybe never. But you're going to decide. You know, Dr. King used to say, quoting Theodore Parker, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. And I always thought that was very comforting. 
sort of felt like, well, no matter how bad things are, the arc of the moral universe is bending towards justice. But I don't believe that. Because I don't think Theodore Parker and Martin Luther King, I, I don't think they anticipated Fox News and, uh, and a lot of other things that have come along. I think the arc of the moral universe is going to bend towards justice if, if enough people are trying to push it in that direction. And I think that, as Dr. King said, we stand on the shoulders of others so that someday people stand on our shoulders. And we look at the work of Dr. King and Clarence Darrow and Thurgood Marshall and Constant Baker Motley and so many other people in terms of trying to influence the arc of the moral universe and where we move forward on things like the right to counsel. I want to tell you a story about two lawyers you never heard of and I want because I think everybody will know about them. Styles Hutchins, Noah Parton. Two African American lawyers who at the turn of the century in nineteen hundred were practicing law in Chattanooga, Tennessee. African-American man named Ed Johnson was convicted of rape, sentenced to death. And his court-appointed lawyers convinced him not to appeal. It was great lawyering back in those days, just like we have today. And so he was going to be executed. And his father goes to this law firm and sees Stiles Hutchins and asks him if he will represent him. And this is, of course, the community. This is a case in which the community is absolutely outraged and can't wait to execute this guy. And asks him if he'll take the case, and Hutchins goes back and talks to Pardon, and, uh, excuse me, the other way around, Pardon goes back and talks to Hutchins and says, will we take the case? Yes. And Noah Pardon takes a train to Washington and argues the case before Justice Harlan, the first African-American to ever argue in the Supreme Court of the United States. And the Supreme Court grants uh, Justice Harlan, acting as one justice, grants a stay of execution. And that night, with the help of the sheriff, a mob breaks into the jail and takes Ed Johnson out and winches him and uh, shoots him a number of times and then ties a rope around his neck and throws him over the bridge. If you've been to Chattanooga, it's a bridge right over the river that runs through the middle of Chattanooga. And the minister who had been preaching uh, preached a sermon that Sunday about lynching his house burned down. No pardon in Stiles Hutchins uh, left Chattanooga and never came back. They ended their law practice. And you know, there had to be a time when, that time when, when Pardon went to Hutchins and said, are we going to take this case? They had to know that if they took that case, things would never be the same again. You can imagine the, you know, these two African Americans, the only two black lawyers in Chattanooga, all these years, they've built this practice. They've got a successful law practice. And now here's one case that comes to them. And they're asked, will you take this case? And this African-American man, convicted of raping his white woman, and they know what's going to happen. Well, lawyers don't have those kind of challenges today, but we're inspired by people who rose to the occasion uh, when they did. I think this is a time when we can look at the challenge posed by Anthony Lewis and say that while others may have failed in the last 46 years, this generation of lawyers will not fail. That this generation of lawyers has seen what the mindless pursuit of wealth has done for investment bankers, for hedge fund managers and law firm partners that this generation is ready to respond to Ali when he says our lives are not our own, they belong to those who need us desperately, and to Dr. King when he called upon us to become drum majors for justice. And that at this historic moment, after a nightmare of indifference and his hostility and fear-mongering, it is ready to walk into the bright sunshine of hope and promise and confidence and to this task say, yes, we can.